Hey, Gina. Hiya. Hiya. How are you? I'm great. Yourself? Welcome in. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I love your background. That I, you know, I need one of those too. We've been having the most fun with backgrounds these last few days. It's people with biodiversity all over the world. I love it. So I want to dive right in with your presentation, literally and figuratively. Like we are keeping the ocean excitement going. Uh, and so uh, without further ado, yeah, we are joined by Sheena Talma. She is a science program manager of the Necton Foundation. And she is going to showcase us to us today one of the most beautiful, amazing places in the world in the Seychelles. So when a place sounds as pretty as it is, that doesn't happen very often. I'm excited to dive in. Um, and I'm sure all our guests from joining all over the world will be equally keen. Sheena, thanks so much for joining us and take us away. Great, thank you so much for having me. Like I said, um, just want to make sure that you can see my screen. You are all set. It's beautiful. Fantastic. Okay, so um, so I'm going to talk about the Seychelles and um, a little bit about where I'm from and from the mountain tops to the deep. So this is going to cover a couple of things, um, including just an overview of the Seychelles and um, also my experiences with the biodiversity here and um, the career it's led me um, to. So let's kick off. Great. So um, the Seychelles are a group of islands off the coast of Africa. So they're a group of granitic and coralline islands. So you might be used to seeing um, islands such as Hawaii, maybe if you're from um, the Pacific Ocean, um, and they're also very high islands. But these are different because they broke off the continent of Africa and Asia a very, very long time ago. Um, whereas islands like Mauritius or Hawaii um, were built from volcanic action. So quite different. Then we also have coralline islands, which are these low lying um, islands um, that we have. And they're towards, we call them the outer islands of the 115 group of islands. So also very beautiful, um, but I'm gonna start off with some highlights of the Seychelles. So I'm sure you've heard, if you were following, um, we had some other great speakers from the Seychelles, um, uh, Dr. Rolf Payette and also Helena Smith, who spoke about the marine spatial planning and um, global climate change. So the Seychelles has these um, cocodimers, which are the biggest nuts in the world. Um, they can get up to 25 kilograms. So the actual nut, which is, that's a female, and that's um, the male over here, can get up to 25 kilograms, which is massive. Um, the actual plants um, take a very, very long time to grow, um, more than 25 years in some cases, uh, and take about six years to germinate. So some really special adaptations to being um, isolated in the middle of the Indian Ocean. But there's some also some other cool um, endemic palms. So it's not just the uh, coconuts. There's also these palm trees that have adapted to grow spikes on their bark, um, on their stem, so that tortoises can't eat them. So very, very cool adaptation. And these are endemic to the Seychelles as well. Last one of the um, Seychelles endemics um, are the carnivorous plants, pitcher plants that grow on the mountain tops. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, and this, uh, this plant, which is the jellyfish tree, um, which is critically endangered, just because it's really, it, we don't know a lot about it. Um, it's really difficult to research and um, yeah, they just grow in very uh, specific areas within the Seychelles mountain tops. But of course, there's also some animals here, here about. The only mammals that we have that are endemic to Seychelles are bats. And there are only two species. Um, these are the fruit bats, which you see over here with the very cute brown face. Um, and they eat fruits and insects. And you get the night bats, the insectivorous bat bats that are also critically endangered, 
um, and there um, they generally feed at night. So these are night bats and these are day bats. The day bats are extremely noisy. And although we don't have a lot of uh, birds, uh, a lot of bats, we do have lots of birds, um, and all of them have evolved some special characteristics so that they can feed um, on the organisms within their habitats. One of my favorites is the Seychelles white eye, which we see over here. Um, and because it's a great conservation success story. So this little bird, um, this little bird's population was dwindling uh, in 2006, and they relocated uh, some of these birds to other islands and enabled new populations to regenerate. So it's a really, really great um, success story. So why do I love biodiversity? Well, for me, it's because um, they've been with me ever since I was a little kid, um, and they've been on the journey of me becoming a marine scientist. So I grew up um, in the mountaintops at the foot of one of the tallest mountains on Mahe, which is the main island of Seychelles. And I always wanted to have a pet bear and a pet wolf, um, but obviously that's not something that exists in the Seychelles. Um, so I had to do with frogs. So there were lots of frogs in my backyard, especially these frogs, because the endemics, um, the endemic frogs of Seychelles are actually quite, uh, live quite high up in forests. So I had to content myself with these frogs and I loved looking at them, loved looking at the tadpoles and how um, they went from being a tadpole to a full grown frog. The other thing I like to think about my journey um, as be of being a marine scientist, it's, it's like a river. So it started in the mountain tops, just like the frogs, and uh, moved towards the ocean. So in my teenage years, um, when I was around 16, I used to go work on a private island within the Seychelles. And this was every holiday, and it was something I looked forward to because I got to learn more about the environment. I got to interact with tortoises and turtles and terrapins. And this is when I first moved into the plateau area, as I like to say. I moved away from the mountains and into the plateau every holiday to interact with guests um, that came to this island where they um, believed in preserving the environment and the ecosystem. And I loved walking around and giving talks about tortoises, um, which we have one huge species in the Seychelles called the Aldabra giant tortoises um, and terrapins, also known as uh, freshwater turtles. So we have two species of freshwater turtles um, that live in marshes here in the Seychelles. So I moved away from the mountains, moved away from the um, marsh area and went towards the sandy beaches and learned more about turtles. And this is really where I really got excited because I was really close to the beach and um, I got mentored by some fantastic scientists. Um, and I learned about these turtles that have been protected in the Seychelles um, since uh, the 1990s. So in the Seychelles, we have four species of turtles. Um, but the species that come up to the beaches to lay are hawksbill turtles, which is this one over here on your um, left hand side, and the green turtle, which is on your left hand, on your right hand side. So the biggest difference between the two is here in the Seychelles, your hawksbills come out during the day, especially when you want to have lunch. Generally, that's when they'll come out to the beach and you have to run to make sure that they're nesting in a good area and no one disturbs them. Um, and your green turtles will come out at night. But you can also tell the difference by looking at their um, physiology. So if you look at their faces, the hawksbill has like a hawk bill, which is why it's called a hawksbill. Um, and it's a lot smaller, whereas the green turtle has a rounded face um, and is a lot so that was my taste um, of, the sea sh of the shore. 
line um, and you know the animal that goes from the water onto the, onto the sand. So the the first time I really got excited about being in, in the ocean is um, when I first started diving. So this was also on this island. I spent a lot of time there during my holidays, um, over five years, um, and just learning as much as I could. And one of their policies was that you could learn to dive for free. So um, I jumped on the opportunity and my first plunge absolutely got me, oh, got me hooked. Sorry. So just being able to be underwater and experiencing, you know, this completely different ecosystem. Um, to me, like corals looked like trees and fish were all these other, you know, biodiversity that um, I was accustomed to um, eating. And when I used to snorkel, I used to, you know, take some interest in it. But when I put on the, my dive kit and was able to get really close and personal, with the corals and see like little porcelain crabs that lived um, in these corals, it made me really excited. So um, I won two scholarships and was able to go study to become an ichthyologist. So an ichthyologist is someone who studies fish. Um, and I went away to South Africa and did that for seven years. because I, I wanted to understand these animals that lived in this ecosystem and the plights um, that they were faced with. So after seven years of being far away from warm tropical waters, um, I came back and was looking for opportunities to be able to um, invest what I had learned. So these opportunities came in two fantastic ways and this was only last year. Um, the first one was through the Aldabra Cleanup Project. So you might know there's lots of plights facing our ocean there's overfishing, there's climate change, um, and uh, plastic, all of which are mostly man-made. So the Aldabra Cleanup Project recruited uh, 12 volunteers, six from Oxford and six from the Seychelles, and put them together. And we had to raise over 100, 150,000 um, pounds to go to this World Heritage Site to clean it of as much plastic debris as we could. So where is Aldabra? So Aldabra is part of the Seychelles. It is a, a thousand, more than a thousand kilometers away from my main island, Mahe, where I grew up. But it, it's where every Seychellois wants to go. It's like the Galapagos of the Indian Ocean. Um, and it's teeming with life. This area has been protected for over 40 years now. It's got giant tortoises, it's got green turtles like cockroaches. There's this huge lagoon and there's just, it's just full of green turtles. Really difficult to explain um, how amazing the biodiversity is there. They've got whales and dolphins and flamingos, which is the only island within the, um, the Seychelles group that has uh, these flamingos. It's also got black to reef sharks and bonefish. It's got so much fish in its waters. But unfortunately, it's being um, inundated and has been inundated in the past by so much plastic. And this isn't coming from the Seychelles Islands. These are coming from all over the world. We sit in a location where currents uh, push all the plastic debris onto the outer islands of the Seychelles. And of course, um, these have a very terrible effect, um, especially when it comes to turtles, they get tangled in them. Um, at the bottom, you can see a dimorphic egret with a piece of plastic over its beak, which means it, it can't feed after that. 
So this project took us all 12 volunteers for five weeks to this island that's remote. It's very, very dry. It is beautiful, but this island sometimes feels like it wants to kill you because it gets super hot. There's this really um, hard rock that if you fall on um, can really damage your skin. Um, and we collected by the end of the five weeks A total of 25 tons of plastic. 54% of this was fishing gear and 24% was flip flops. In fact, that's like 60,000 um, pairs of flip flops. That's a lot of flip flops that we collected. And all this was transported back to our main island, Mahe, um, where some of it has been recycled through various programs. But of course, one of the biggest problems with plastic is that it's really hard to recycle and that um, and a lot of the work needs to be done at the at the source. So we need to turn off the taps. So the second pr program project that I was part of that really aimed to increase knowledge about our oceans and get people excited and create awareness was the first descent um, Seychelles, which was run by Necton in partnership with the Seychelles government. So the great thing about this organization is that they work on behalf of governments um, to implement and learn more about the oceans around um, the island states and um, really involve the host country scientists. So I was very fortunate to be one of the scientists to go on. And this is my first experience being in a submersible. I was blown out of my mind because I'd only been um, I'd only been diving before, and when you dive, you only dive to about thirty meters maximum. Um, so this was taking me down to two hundred and fifty meters. So the experience of being in a submersible is like really hard to explain because you go from a really loud ship um, onto a submersible where it's quiet and all you hear in the background is like tick, 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 which is a um, communication system between the sub and the, the vessel and that's it and it's just these bubbles and these animals all around you in this particular I completely missed the manta that was um, swimming right behind us because we were so like intent on getting all the data we needed. Because you don't go down in the subs just for fun. They're there to collect um, specific samples, um, but also to video the organisms along a transect so we can find out what kind of animals live there, what kind of corals live, live there as well. So. That was um, that was an unexplainable experience. Um, a lot of people ask me what it feels like, but it's it's definitely something you never forget. But the thing that really really um, stays with you is what you see underwater. So you go from ten meters. So when we go from 10 meters, it's generally um, a lot lighter than when you, the 10 meter doesn't want to play, so we just gonna go on. This is about 30 meters, 60 yeah. meters, and light is a lot less. Um, and the corals change as well. So in the top layer, the 10 meters, it's like lots of corals on top of each other, lots of fish moving very quickly. At 60 meters, uh, corals are, um, more like fan corals. Um, and then we get a couple of like these encrusting corals, which are really, really cool. And this is at 30 meters. So this has a diver you're pretty used to. Then when you go down to like 120 meters, it completely changes. This is something I was 
mind blown about because there, there weren't as many fish buzzing around, but um, the corals all looked like these whips. Um, and I had ne never seen coral like that. But this is the mind boggling part. At 250 meters, it's, it's like the surface of the moon. At least that's what I feel like the surface of the moon would look like. A um, lot less fish, but then you get a lot of sea urchins and a basket stars and all these cool things that you're not used to seeing at the surface. But the thing I love the most, because uh, my dives, um, two of my dives were done around Aldabra. So like I said, I got to see Aldabra on the surface and under the sea, which is um, very, very rare. And Aldabra had the best fish life that I have ever seen. We had potato groupers, it's big grouper um, that came right up to the submersibles that were super friendly. There were tuna everywhere, there were sharks. It was just an incredible and um, amazing place. So what have I learned so far? So we've gone from the mountains right down to about 300 meters. Um, and for me, I take a lot of lessons from Aldabra. Firstly, protection seems to work because uh, I've dived in a couple of other places around um, Seychelles, especially within the inner groups where I come from. Um, and the fish life isn't as great. Um, and that's obviously because there's a lot more fishing pressure in the inner islands than there are on the outer islands, especially around Aldabra where it's protected. Uh, the other things that I've learned is jump on experiences. Um, I generally never say no to an experience, uh, even if I'm afraid. Like the first time I ever went diving, I was really, really scared, um, but I never say no to an experience. Um, yeah, and there's just still so much to learn. Yeah, those are my three main lessons that I learned from the biodiversity that surrounds me and my career so far. Fantastic. Sheena, what a beautiful presentation. Your, uh, your joy and reverence for nature and the experience you've had are so palpable. It's awesome. Um, and by the way, I just want to note for people at home that might be tuning in, you know, thinking that this deep sea submersibles, that happens all the time. There's probably in the low thousands of people ever in human history that have gone down that deep in a submersible. So lucky you and uh, thanks so much yeah. for sharing your experience. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Jesse. So uh, a few questions, let's dive in. If you want to come out of screen share actually so we can see you, it would be awesome uh, to, to be able to chat. Oh, sure. Take your time. Yeah. So our, our first question is, you know, you, you go to this super remote, even by the Seychelles standards at all in Aldabra. And it's this totally unique ecosystem. It's incredible. And it's absolutely packed with trash. Now, kudos to you guys for cleaning it up, but what can kids do at home? Like again, 90 countries we've had people tune in from over the last few days. Um, what can people do to prevent trash from getting out to the to Aldabra, to the Seychelles in the first place? Well, I think it's the biggest thing is consumption, right? So the whole point with the Aldabra cleanup project is that we know we can't take out all the trash that is on Aldabra, okay? Because it's just so much and there's like little bits of fragments of plastic that's just fused into the sand. So the first thing to do is stop consuming as much as we do. That's the number one thing. Um, we don't need 50 pairs of shoes. We don't need, um, you know, like to buy a reuse, a, re, uh, a plastic bottle that you can only use once. Right. Buy your bottle, refill it. It's the simple things. But I think it's also putting pressure on, um, our governments and systems to change the way the the way we've always done things. I think COVID-19 has taught us a lot in that sense that um, perhaps certain things aren't working and we really need to change our mentalities and the way of our things. Fantastic. And, and certainly, you know, that, that's been one of the overriding messages over the last day and a half or two days now of, of fantastic presentations. So I'm really glad we got that message in. You are back on screen share, actually. We've got your desktop background uh, there. So if, if you're showing something, by all means, but just want to let you know. Um, sorry about that. Can you see me? I can see you in a little okay, box, great. but your main screen is your, your desktop. Ah, uh, let me try and change that. <laughs> <laughs> Much rather see you in that cool coral behind you. More fun. Um, 
while you're getting that ready, um, yeah. we are uh, just, we got a question in about the chytrid fungus. This is something we've been covering amphibians a lot, and you highlighted such beautiful frogs at the beginning of your presentation. Um, do you know if the chytrid fungus has made it to the Seychelles yet, or? Um... To my knowledge, it hasn't. Okay. Uh, yeah, so to my knowledge, it hasn't. Um, I do know that, for example, where I lived in South Africa, there was a huge program about that yeah. and trying to make people more aware about um, the issue involved and the loss of biodiversity that comes with it. Um, yeah. But yeah, to my knowledge, here in the Seychelles, we're still good. We're happy to hear that. Whew. Any good conservation story is, is fantastic. And hopefully you guys can keep it out because you have such a beautiful biodiversity there of amphibians. Um, Sheena, what is it like when you, you dive in the ocean every time? I mean, you talked about this, this first experience diving and how incredible it was. And do you get that same buzz every time you step off the boat? And like explain that to us, some of us that are, are land lovers here in the middle of continents. <laughs> yeah, so actually, um, when I get into the water, especially like um, diving, I, I am extremely afraid. <laughs> you know, you've got a lot of presenters that come on and say like, yeah, I just love it. It's just crazy. <laughs> um, but actually for me, I grew up um, going to the sea like every Sunday and having fun. But when I was little, I nearly drowned, which meant means that although I still love the ocean, I'm still yeah. very respectful of it. And I'm still very aware of like how powerful it is. Um, so I think for me, I get excited. I'm also a little bit scared. Once I'm down there and I see a turtle, I giggle away. But in the beginning, I'm scared. I'm really glad you mentioned that actually. So we, we regularly bring on a woman named Jill Heinerth. She's one of the top cave divers in the world. And they always ask, oh, you, are you, you must not be afraid. And she goes, I'm afraid every single time. I mean, it is like black magic that we can breathe underwater and we should be very respectful of that. But again, when the turtles show up, it is, it is worth uh, you know getting just super excited. So great answer, Gina. So the Seychelles, I mean, I, I got a chance to go to Madagascar personally. I've always wanted to go to the Seychelles, just this magical island group. And one of the things that, that unites those places and some of the other places we've highlighted over the last few days is that they seem very pristine. And so what are your thoughts on tourism, mass tourism coming to such a unique place? Because it's incredible to introduce people to a place like the Seychelles, but also you want to make sure that the, the reason that people are coming gets preserved. Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Um, I mean, for Seychelles, I think they've been so far um, in the past, they've been very clever about the type of tourism they attract. Nice. So they like to attract people who, so, who love the environment, for example, or at least are willing to pay very high prices to come here. As you might know, um, Seychelles is one of the cheapest destinations in the Indian Ocean. Um, and I think it that in exclusivity to some extent um, has helped with our nature because we can't actually cope with like millions of tourists coming here every year. That's just right. the thing we can't do. Um, for example, Aldabra, uh, which is this World Heritage UNESCO site, um, it does allow tourists there. But again, the tourists that come there um, have to pay a lot of money, which pays for the upkeep um, of Aldabra because right. conservation costs. <laughs> um, so I think tourism can work hand in hand. Um, North Island, where I worked when I was a teenager, what is a clear um, demonstration of that, um, where they worked with the environment and their whole aim was to bring North Island back to what it used to be. Although it might seem pristine, there has been a lot of changes um, that has happened on many of the islands more so in the granitic, so the inner islands, where most of the population live, okay. um, where these outer islands, the flat ones, don't have a population that live there throughout the year, necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Sheena, uh, amazingly, we are getting near the end of our presentation, which I mean, is just too bad because I would explore the Seychelles with you all day long. So before we wrap up, is there any last message you want to share about this, this beautiful place you call home uh, and, and encouraging people to learn even more? Anywhere we can send people to learn more about this incredible place? Definitely. So um, if you type in, you know, Seychelles, you type in Seychelles Island Foundation, you can learn more about Aldabra. If you want to learn more about the Aldabra Cleanup Project, there's a short uh, documentary on YouTube. You can type that in and it will come up. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, the Seychelles is trying to be a beacon within the Indian Ocean 
um, especially with our conservation efforts, um, reaching 30% protection by 2020, when the target is 2030, is a huge, um, yeah, like a huge positive and shows yeah. that other countries can do it if we all put um, the investment in. Nice job. Well, what a fantastic message to leave on, Sheena. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. And we really appreciate you uh, being a part in it. Thanks your- for having me, Jesse. All right. Well, we'll see you soon and have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, Thanks. And- with that, we'll keep the, the Global Bio Festival going. We'll bring in Thomas, who's doing your next presentation. And uh, thanks again. All right. Bye. Bye. Have a nice rest of your day.